Well, who would have expected that? Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Feels like we don't get out enough some days, and I'm delighted that you're all here with us uh, this evening. I have a little bit of housekeeping to do. No good event runs without housekeeping. So, firstly, we have two Auslan interpreters with us today from Deaf Connect. Please welcome Will and Yasmin. Live captioning is available for those at home, which is very exciting. Please note we are filming and recording this event. For our audience in the room, please switch your phones off now. Everyone reaches for them, it's hysterical. Go on, I know, I know you need to do it. Please also, those in the room, be mindful of the cameras. Now, as is our way, our first order of business is always to welcome one of our esteemed, cherished elders. And tonight we're very honoured to have Uncle Chick and Madam with us to welcome us to country. So please join me in welcoming Uncle to the stage. Thank you. Good evening, folks. My name is Charles Madden, but known around the inner city of Sydney as Chicka. Now, that's a nickname that I got many, many years ago going to Redfern Public School, which is now NCIE, the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence. Folks, I'm from Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. That's the land we're on at the moment. For many, many years, I've lived and worked around the city of Sydney, I've been involved with quite a few Aboriginal organisations over the years. I've been a director with the Aboriginal Medical Service at Redfern for over 40 years. Also a director with the Redfern Aboriginal Housing Company, Aboriginal Hostels Australia, and the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. I've got to mention it, folks. Also, a life member of the Redfern All Blacks Rugby League Football Club. <laughs> Folks, for many, many years I've lived and worked around the city of Sydney. I'd like to take this opportunity this afternoon, or this evening, to extend a warm and sincere welcome to all of my Aboriginal brothers and sisters, non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, we have any brothers and sisters here from the Torres Strait or further afar across the seas. Welcome. Welcome to Gadigal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 that makes up the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bordered by three distinctive landmarks. We have the Hawkesbury River to the north, the Peen to the west and the Georges River to the south. Those three rivers form the boundaries of the Eora Nation. Folks, if you've travelled across this city of ours, the state or this great country, all from afar, welcome. Welcome to Gadigal land. Enjoy your stay. Have a safe and trouble-free trip home. Once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Enjoy the evening, folks. Thank you. I too would also lend my voice to acknowledging this wonderful, wonderful country that we're on and to the Gadigal people present here today and to all people who are present here today and recognise this land has never been ceded and never been sold. So, welcome to Sydney Ideas. This is the flagship public talks program. My name is Lisa jackson Pulver. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Indigenous Strategy and Services, and I'm a Professor of Public Health, amongst other things. I am your host for this evening's wonderful event. It's the second of our Voices on Voice event, where we continue the discussion about the Indigenous voice to Parliament. 
This is presented in collaboration with members of my portfolio, the National Centre for Cultural Competence and, of course, Sydney Ideas. Tonight, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions in the second half of this hour. More on how the audience Q&A will work is when we get to that, but at any point of this event, I invite you to uh, submit any questions via Slido. So that's uh, slido.com if you would like to just get your phone out on silent and uh, log into Slido, and as uh, we're listening to our esteemed speaker for this evening, you can pop in your questions there. The code is, of course, Sydney Ideas. At the conclusion of tonight's event, uh, you'll be invited to share some light refreshments with us uh, in the room behind us. I'm also going to be asking you to join me in something very, very special just before we leave this room after Professor Mark Scott has spoken. We're really excited about having Professor Langton with us tonight. She's a remarkable individual whose contribution to academia and Indigenous rights advocacy has left an absolute indelible mark upon all of us, uh, certainly on our society and certainly on the academy as a whole. We are privileged to have her with us today and her presence is a testament to the power of knowledge and dedicated dedication in making a positive impact on society. To uh, perform... Uh, more uh, formal introduction of our guest speaker, I would like to invite our Chancellor, Belinda Hutchinson, to induce uh, Professor Langton. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I too would like to thank Uncle Chika for his very, very warm welcome, welcome to country. And I, I would also like to pay my respects to the Gaddy people, their elders past, present and emerging. These people have been teaching, learning, sharing ideas on these lands for tens of thousands of years. And that's what's so special about this evening's event. It's all about continuing to share ideas, continuing to learn from each other, continuing to be part of a community. And this is, as Lisa has said, is the second in the series of these Voices on the Voice events that we've had. We had the inspiring evening in May with Noel Pearson, and we're so looking forward to hearing from you, Marcia. It's so kind of you to join us. And it's so exciting because this has been an absolute sellout event. We couldn't fit any more in the room, but we're so excited to also have people online. So thank you for joining us online. It's great to have you with us. This Voices on the Void series is all about recognising the responsibility of our university to bring people together to discuss a critical moment for Australia, a critical moment to reflect on where we are today and, as a nation, to build shared aspirations for the future. And that future will be shaped by the decisions we make in the coming months. This event is one in which we aim to enrich and inform understanding and dialogue about the voice among our university community of students and staff, but also the community we serve. So tonight it's important that we listen both to understand the collective tasks we have ahead of us, but also to make sure when the time comes to shape our future, we are empowered as individuals to vote with knowledge and with conviction and passion. Of course, today's university students will play a vital role in that future. And one of the particular pleasures for me as chancellor at the university here is to celebrate our students as they graduate in the great hall of our university in the next stage of their life. This evening, we gather only a few hundred meters from that great hall. And this is where a group of our University of Sydney students, led by Charles Perkins, began a remarkable journey back in 1965. The Freedom Rides, just a few years before the 1967 referendum, was a student-led movement that exposed racism and inequality in Australia. These events changed our nation for the better. And we are very proud to count Charles Perkins among the many University of Sydney alumni who have become what we call leaders for good. 
We are very proud that such a significant figure in Australia's history was the first Aboriginal person to graduate from this university. But we must face up to the reality that the university existed for 100 years before any First Nations person graduated from here. As a major part of Australian public life, we must acknowledge that the benefits of our university being on this land for more than 170 years have not always been shared to the benefit of Australia's First Peoples. And as an important institution in the nation, we must continue to better understand the impact of our teaching and research throughout our history. So it's very important for me that we've taken a number of further steps along the journey since the time I've been Chancellor over the past 10 years. I'm grateful for the work of Lisa and her team and many others around our campus who've really made us recognise unfinished business and that we are progressing that work through the contributions of many of our individual academics, through the work of our National Centre for Cultural Competence and our One Sydney Many People strategy. Of course, we know we have much more work to do. And part of that work continues this evening. So it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Marcia Langton AO. A prominent anthropologist and geographer, Professor Langton has enriched and shaped our thinking on Australian life and history. She has influenced colleagues and students and the university in, and made a tangible impact on how we engage in our history. A fearless leader, her advocacy and commitment to progressing Indigenous recognition reaches far and wide, well beyond the realms of academia. She has been, a cru she has been crucial to the national dialogue and development of the Indigenous voice to Parliament. From being a key member of the referendum working group to co-authoring a vital report about the design and implementation of the voice with Tom Karma. Professor Langton, Marcia, thank you for your leadership in these challenging and critical times. This is absolutely so important for our future and we're absolutely delighted to have you with us tonight and we're all very much looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I see he's gone, but many thanks to Uncle Chicka uh, Madden uh, for his very elegant and warm welcome to country here on Gadigal land. Uh, so I acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation all their elders, the traditional owners, and their young people, uh, the ones who are coming through and cutting their teeth now in Indigenous affairs, striving to find a place of dignity for themselves and others in this vexed landscape of Australia, where we, the First Peoples, remain without constitutional recognition, and where most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are disadvantaged or extremely disadvantaged. So thank you so much, uh, Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor, Group Captain, Lisa Jackson-Pulver, uh, JB, uh, Alex and many others uh, for getting me here. And uh, <clears throat> I'm very grateful for this opportunity to tell you my point of view about the referendum question that you will be voting on later this year. Uh, <clears throat> so, you've been told over and over again that this constitutional alteration question is very simple and clear. And for many people it isn't, and I understand that. And the 
what seems simple uh, might might be if you have a law degree in expertise in constitutional law. Um, but if you're an ordinary person, it's, uh, it doesn't seem clear at all. So what it represents is profound. And I think this is where people get rattled. So yes, a change to the constitution is a very big step for Australians. And they, they want to know, doesn't matter if you're Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, or non-Indigenous, people want to know, well, what does this mean for the future? What will the future look like if we vote for this change? And that, I say, is a perfectly legitimate question. So yes, it's more than symbolic recognition in voting yes on this question, because along with the proposition that the Constitution would be changed if you voted yes to recognise the First Peoples um, by establishing a voice to Parliament and the Executive Government to enable Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to make representations on matters that affect them. That is the practical element, which added to the symbolic element of constitutional recognition makes for a very powerful whole that I think will not only give dignity to Indigenous Australians, but dignity to all Australians. It will mean in the end, if we get there, that we can put behind us that ugly colonial history uh, that really, I think, will always be the, divide, the divisive matter that keeps us apart. Now, you will remember the <clears throat> apology by Kevin Rudd, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in 2008 to the Stolen Generations. That apology was recommended by the final Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation in two, the year 2000, when it made its, the council made its final report to government as required under the Act. Their 10 years was up, and the chairman, Patrick Dodson, handed the final report to then Prime Minister John Howard. And in it were many recommendations, and one of them was find a pathway to constitutional reform and another one was to apologise to the stolen generations. There were others to do with how money is allocated to Indigenous affairs, resulting in unfairness and wastage. John Howard rejected all of those recommendations, every one of them. And eight years later, well, in fact, nine, almost nine, John Howard's rejection of the very idea that these people had been removed from their families forcibly as children uh, was, I think, you know, subjected to some honest scrutiny and Prime Minister Kevin Rudd apologised in Parliament his government consulted widely. Most of the remaining victims of the policy turned up at Parliament House. Their families turned up and there were hundreds of people there. And he, he meant it. I think we all know that he meant it. And what was the impact of that apology? Well, if you listened to it and if you watched what happened on that day, you'll know that it healed the nation. Was it cause it acknowledged a past wrong and it vindicated the members of the stolen generation who wanted the world to believe that what had happened to them was unjust, it was wrong. The apology set that right. In 1901, 
when Australians woke up on January 1, they were no longer colonists, they were no longer British, they were suddenly Australians. That was the day that our constitution became, uh, came into effect. It was an act and is an act of the Westminster Parliament and it was written entirely by white male colonists. Now, they did a number of things to completely exclude the first peoples from the Constitution. And you'll hear a lot of lies about this, and you probably have heard them already. Um, so it, uses, it used the word race a number of times. It excluded the natives from being counted in reckoning the citizens of the Commonwealth. It, it, it prevented the Commonwealth Parliament from making laws for Aborigines. So the Commonwealth could make laws for the peace and good order of, you know, of the Commonwealth, except for Aborigines. It contained uh, a section, it still contains this section, section 25, which is a hangover from the White Australia days, and it uh, enabled the Commonwealth to, to give constitutional support to the states, the new states, the former colonies, when they were denying the right to vote or the franchise to certain kinds of people. I don't have to tell you who they were, do I? Um, uh, much later, an Indian man challenged that, uh, challenged his lack of a right to vote and won. Uh, and slowly but surely, the white Australia policy was torn down. In fact, one of the great contributors to ending that disgusting policy was your first Aboriginal graduate, the late Charles Perkins. Um, some people in this room will remember that he not only organised the, with his fellow students, the Freedom Rides, uh, and they started from a bus right here in front of the Great Hall, but he also ran onto the tarmac when the immigration officials had grabbed a little Fijian girl and were deporting her alone back to Fiji. He ran onto the tarmac and grabbed her and took her into his care to stop her from being deported. And it was all over the newspapers and drew attention to how vicious that policy was. But I think we've seen similar uh, circumstances just recently too, haven't we? Um, so, in 1967, there was a referendum and a question was put to the Australian people, uh, do you agree with the proposition and I'm just making a long story short here, to remove the words, except for Aborigines, from section 5126, which prevented the Commonwealth from legislating on any matter that affected us. And also the, I think it was section 127 that excluded the natives from being uh, counted in any reckoning of the citizens of the Commonwealth. Uh, you might have heard Professor Blaney uh, giving his spin on this. Um, I don't agree with him. Um, <clears throat> the reason for all of that exclusion was about the money. It's always about the money. It wasn't just about the, you know, racial hygiene and keeping the, keeping the natives out. It was also about the money. So this was explained in a footnote 
in a constitutional uh, text by Lanaus. And I found it in a footnote and I thought, oh, that answers all sorts of questions. So if the colonists were mainly in Victoria and New South Wales, because they you know, hadn't made it into the north at that time in the late 19th century uh, in great numbers, and this is, you know, it was in these two colonies where all the money was. And because they designed a federation with a Commonwealth taxation uh, a, a rule that the money was to be collected by the Commonwealth and then redistributed to the new states, they couldn't have the money going to those new states with very large Aboriginal populations because they'd, you know, of their calculations. So in order for the money to only go to white people, they excluded Aboriginal people by all these different means in the census, in the law making, uh, and so on. And the architecture set up by the constitution lasted well past 1967. Now it's true, that over 90% of Australians voted to get rid of the racist phrase in section 51, 26 and in 127. It's, that's true. They, Australians then thought they were voting for equality. That's what they were led to believe. But, you know, as just as today, they hadn't read the Constitution. It's only 78 pages. I urge you to read it. Even though there was that happened, we remain this kind of ghostly figure in the Constitution. We're not really there because we were excluded by deleting the racist phrase doesn't include us. That doesn't really include us. We're still actually effectively excluded because then the High Court interpreted the new wording of 5126 to mean that the Commonwealth could make laws uh, to our detriment. And that was in the Cartinary case. So it's a matter of black letter law that the Commonwealth can cause us harm, according to the High Court. Now, one would think that a generous, compassionate government would say, well, that's just black letter law. Let's pass an act, let's pass some legislation to make sure that our legislation that affects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples meets certain basic standards. Might be human rights standards, might be civil rights standards. Um, and that never happened. In fact, to the contrary, if you look at what has happened to us in the last 10 years, it's really difficult to point to anything uh, that's made our lives better. Um, I won't go on about all of the legislation that I find offensive, but of course the fact of the matter is that the Commonwealth is exempt from the Racial Discrimination Act. State and territory governments aren't, but the Commonwealth is. So the Commonwealth can treat us in a racist manner. The Commonwealth can cause us detriment at law. So it's worse than just an absence. We're actually vulnerable. We are at risk legally, constitutionally, and as a matter of practice. So everybody reads the Closing the Gap report, the Productivity Interim Report on Closing the Gap, and we all know that governments are not meeting, to, and probably will never meet, two of the 19 targets. Well, in the Northern Territory, it's eight that are not being met and will probably never be met. Eight out of 19. And that was pointed out yesterday by Leslie Turner in The Guardian. 
So it was back in, I think, let me find the year. I've worked, I've worked uh, for many years as a volunteer, a rouseabout, uh, all sorts of things in Arnhem Land. I was a field officer for the Fred Hollows um, first tour of Arnhem Land to check people's eyes back in 1977. And uh, over the years I've met many great leaders and it was my great honour to be a friend of uh, Dr Yunapingu, the leader of the Gumach clan who passed away recently. So in 2007, he raised with me his desire to see Aboriginal people recognised in the constitution. Uh, I, I had known about the history of the, the constitution because, you know, I was... I think about 16 uh, during the 67 referendum and watched my elders campaign for the yes vote then in Queensland. So Dr Yunapingo was concerned to ensure that his Yolngu people had a rightful place in the nation. He asked me to find Noel Pearson. He'd never met him. And so a second great graduate of this university, and he graduated from law here, I think, in 1992, um, <clears throat> was then spelling out the framework of his welfare reform strategy, which is now implemented as um, the empowered community strategy by the Cape York Partnerships in Cape York, and... Dr Yunapingu read widely, listened to the radio, demanded briefings, and he was very interested in these policy developments in what was essentially a policy-free zone, as it remains now. And he insisted that I find him. So I did, and I, I told Noel over the phone that uh, Dr Yunapingu wanted to see him as soon as he could possibly get there. Well... Noel had heard about and read about and understood who Dr Yunapingu was and Noel, they hadn't met each other face to face. So Noel turned up on a charter plane with his entourage soon afterwards and they <clears throat> stood on the cliffs at Gulkala uh, where the Gama Festival is now held. Well, it was then and still held. Noel was very much aware of Dr Yunapingu's history in the land rights history from the 1960s, in fact, when he was a... Uh, well, in the 1970s, he was an interpreter for Sir Edward Woodward, the late Sir Edward Woodward, who, was the, who became the first land rights commissioner appointed by Gough Whitlam, when, you know, Gough overcame black letter law. Somebody said to him, no, you can't recognise Aboriginal land rights. Don't be ridiculous, he said. Well, of course, Whitlam was a constitutional lawyer, wasn't he? he and he had a look at the constitution. He said, well, there's nothing to stop me, is there? So he set up the commission. And, of course, it, the Commonwealth could only implement land rights in the Northern Territory, but obviously he'd hoped to, you know, engage the states and other territories in recognising land rights as well. So, um, you know, as a young man and an interpreter for all the clans giving the evidence, you know, he came up through the ranks and was trained by his father, Mungarawoi, to be the clan leader, which he became. Um, and that was the, you know, Milipum v Nabalco case, uh, in the 60s uh, that they were involved in. And that was the case that, that, you know, put into Australian common law this concept of terra nullius. There are people who say, people who write for the Australian who say, there's no such thing as terra nullius. 
or it is actually in the, you know, the case findings. It's not called terra nullius, that's just a Latin shorthand for the concept of, you know, conquered and ceded colonies. And um, it's all there, spelled out very clearly. And that is what prevented the Yolngu from having their ancient rights in land or native title recognised at that time. So Noel was aware of all this history and he was very keen once Gulleroy had, sorry, Dr Yunapingo had explained uh, why he wanted constitutional recognition. And Noel got a huge branch and said, hold it. And they stood there and Noel pulled it. He said, pull it. So they pulled it backwards and forwards. And uh, Noel said, I'll pull from the right and you pull from the left. Let's achieve this together. Um, so that idea of dialogue uh, took shape there at Gulkala. And of course, what both men wanted was to overcome this, you know, what Lyndon B. Johnson called the um, racism of low expectations, the racial exceptionalism, especially in relation to economic participation, alcohol, drugs, violence, failure to attend school, and so on. And... <clears throat> In order for the agency of Aboriginal people to become real, they both realised that the government must listen and give a formal voice to the people. And it was a very democratic idea that developed over time and not well understood, you know, who wants to have these debates over a glass of wine? No, no. Uh, it's not actually the stuff of ordinary conversation, is it? But it is for people who are facing existential threats like the loss of their languages, the loss of clans, the loss of clan names, the loss of the kinship system and so much more. How to perform ceremonies, how to sing songs, how to play the Yadaki, place names, the rules for... In approaching places and being in places, they understood perfectly well that they face a real existential crisis. And still today we face that crisis and now it's measured in the Close the Gap reports. We were invited uh, to serve on the expert panel on constitutional recognition. We did so. We handed in a report to Prime Minister Julia Gillard of about 500 pages um, with a proposition to change the constitution to, by removing section 5126, that provision that enables the Commonwealth to cause us detriment, with a new provision that required the Commonwealth to pass laws for us for our advancement. And the constitutional conservatives went nuts, absolutely nuts. Um, told us to go away, come back with a better idea and Noel then wrote Our Rightful Place in which he envisaged a hook in the constitution which gives us recognition as peoples and then from that hook, as with most things in the constitution, the parliament could then legislate for a, a democratic voice for Indigenous Australians. So then there were two streams of activity. One, the Referendum Council, which involved Professor Megan Davis and Pat Anderson and the Uluru Dialogues and in 2017 the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And the other stream recommended uh, also recommended by the Joint, Joint Select Committee chaired by Julian Lisa and, and Senator Patrick Dodson was the voice co-design process chaired by Professor Tom Calmer and myself. 
So we presented our final report to the Morrison government. Our minister at that time, Ken Wyatt, presented it. Peter Dutton was on that cabinet, received a copy, should have read it. That's what he's paid to do, read the cabinet papers. Um, uh, but he purports not to know any of the detail. Wants to know where the detail is. Where's the detail? Uh, so you have the Referendum Council report and the Voice Co-Design report. You have the Uluru Statement from the Heart and some nice diagrams in our report that makes a big report, a simple exercise in enabling Indigenous people across the country to have representative bodies, vo regional voices, local voices and a national voice. And now we see the question has come together. Constitutional recognition through the establishment of a voice. Announced just over a year ago at the Garma Festival with Dr Yunapingu by his side, our Prime Minister Albanese made a commitment to fully implement the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I urge you to read the Cal Melanchthon Voice Co-Design Report because what will the future look like if we win this election, and I hope even if we don't, the government should legislate something like what we recommended. There are a few problems, I know that, but I commend it to you. I, I think in our two and a half year consultations and deep thinking, I believe that we came up with a, a way to empower Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, to close the gap to have agency in their lives and to have dignity, um, but most of all, to close the gap on disadvantage. If we have constitutional recognition, we will have dignity. So, of course, I'm urging you to vote yes. I'm going to vote yes. I know you will have many questions. I hope I can answer at least some of them well. Uh, but I assure you, the detail's there. It's difficult to read. Uh, but there are many of us who are willing to explain it to you. So I thank you very much for having me here tonight to speak to you about the referendum question and what we face in the future. I hope we face a unified Australia, empowered Indigenous people with a practical way to become engaged in giving advice on how to close the gap and we have a nation that's recognised around the world as having decent standards for all of its citizens and ending the colonial exclusion of Indigenous people from the fabric of the nation. Thank you. Absolutely tremendous, thank you so much. And lots and lots there for us to think about and I have a feeling that you could have spoken for hours, for days, for weeks, for months, for years about your experience. It's interesting because when you pulled up uh, in the vehicle from the airport, um, as soon as um, Professor got out of the vehicle, the driver jumped around and helped get a baggage out and. Uh, was very keen to come and attend this evening. So if you're here, it's lovely to know that you're here. But it's one of those sorts of occasional conversations that people can and should be having with others. I'm just wondering, what is a good way of getting people to understand what this is about without referring them to the really big documents and tones, to take advantage of those conversations that are just ones that you bump into on a good day? Uh, okay, so there's so many things I want to say in answer to that question. I'll start off by saying that there are, by my reckoning, five campaign groups now, uh, possibly more. Uh, so there's the Yes23 campaign, um, yes23.com.au. That brings together uh, people 
such as Dean Parkin, um, Rachel Perkins, and other people who serve on Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition. And then there's um, the Uluru, Dial Uluru uh, Campaign Group. Um, then there's uh, Sean Gordon's Hub, tw Hub 23. Uh, I've joined all three. Um, I'm very eclectic. Um, and there, there, there is even yet another one, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, but I think, you know, there's a slight sense of panic uh, in our ranks because uh, the media keeps saying that we're not getting our message across. And, you know, you, you see articles from uh, journalists and op-ed writers saying, where is their leader? They must have a leader. Where's their leader? Um, well, see, we're, we're not getting our message through, are we? How many times do we have to tell them we're not a race? That, you know, when the British got here, there were hundreds of languages. And if you look at the gumbay.com.au website, people all over the country are putting up their own language groups, registering them, putting evidence of their language groups, people speaking in their language, their grammars, their dictionaries, their school texts and so on. And I think now gumbay has got 600 languages up there. So we've gone from the old, you know, school of linguistics count of perhaps 250, maybe 350, um, to, you know, the linguists now no longer talking about languages and dialects. They now refer to language varieties because, yeah, there are 600 language varieties nominated by the speakers themselves or the descendants of the speakers on that website. So we're not a race. And each one of those language groups probably represents an ancient polity, an ancient jurisdiction that had its own form of governance. Many of them still exist. In northeast Arnhem Land, where Dr Yunapingu was the head of the Gumach clan, the clans have a council that's called the Dilak. And the, each clan puts up not the oldest person, you know, burden the old with, you know, the grubby affairs of governing. They put up a nominee who's senior enough, authoritative enough and, you know, vigorous enough to be involved in governing. Um, and that council met. I've, I've been to some of them over the years and now they're formalising the DILUC as their governance council. It's customary. It's been around for who knows how many uh, thousands of years. And there are such councils across the country. Back in the old days when we had the National Aboriginal Council, people would talk about their tribal councils. They still do. Um, there are these customary governing bodies. So we have many leaders. All the journalists want to have one target to tear down and play gotcha moments on. That's not how we do things. Most of the media coverage is gotcha moments. Right, all the kerfuffle about the treaty this week. What does the Uluru Statement from the Heart say? Voice, treaty, truth. It was read to the nation on TV in 2017 by Megan Davis. Suddenly the media know nothing about it. Oh, huge surprise. Right? It's all, you know, it was talked about in the Referendum Council report. There's a need, the reason for it, and it's called makarata, a word gifted by Dr Yunapingu to the whole Uluru dialogue process, as makarata. And, you know, that's the ritual settling of disputes by means of highly ritualised warfare, right? Or duelling. And once a makarata has been held, the matter's put to rest. It's over. Finished. Um, you're allowed to raise it again. It's settled. So this is what people meant uh, in the old days. And with the gifting of the word to the representatives at the Uluru Convention, 
in 2017, the idea was, well, um, we need a Makarata Commission. There are these treaties happening around the country. We need to make sure that they don't fall below an acceptable standard. What if, you know, people naively negotiate a treaty with a hostile government and give away their rights? give away their existing rights? What if they negotiate a treaty that falls below international treaty standards? Um, so, you know, the idea of a Makarata Commission is, you know, not exactly the Waitangi Tribunal and not a Human Rights Commission, but, you know, we already have the treaty process in Victoria. It's legislated, it's well on its way. They have elect the elected First Peoples Assembly then you have the treaty process in Queensland, and before that, the treaty process in the Northern Territory was started. And on top of that, you have the, the Noongar settlement, which is legislated in the WA Parliament. So, and the Crown is a party. So guess what? The Noongar settlement is a modern treaty, according to Professor George Williams and one of his colleagues. His first name's Harry. Sorry, I've forgotten his last name. Um, so that's a modern treaty, according to these legal scholars. Well, I would add to that that the Western Cape York Agreement, negotiated in 2004 by the WIC peoples, is also a treaty because the Queensland government's a party and it's a comprehensive settlement of the issues. That's also a treaty. So, surprise, surprise, journalists, there are treaties in Australia. Um, and the idea was that we'd set up the voice, uh, and that, you know, eventually we'd set up the Makarata Commission and make sure that, you know, treaties are negotiated according to proper standards. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a treaty and we're going to take your backyards and your hills hoists. Um, anything else we can lay our hands on. Um, the treaty process started many, many years ago, and it's now very well developed, but journalists pay no attention to our issues. They haven't, they can barely get this right. You know, there are very few of them who do. Um, and it's, this is why the public are so confused. It's been misreported by the media. The media use it for their usual game of, oh, look what the Aborigines are doing now, isn't it shocking? Um, and I'm sorry, but the, the main point they consistently miss is that the Uluru Statement from the Heart and all of our work is an invitation to the nation to walk with us. It's an invitation from us, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's not from the government. So why are the journalists asking the Prime Minister and Linda Burney? Why don't they ask us? And seriously, having debates in Parliament about what the Makarata Commission might look like, what the treaty process might look like, is jumping the shark. Can you first of all please understand the referendum question and get that right? No, they can't get that right. They can't even get that right. It's a referendum question. So uh, I really do want people to understand that this is a genuine invitation from 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were elected to go to the first and only Indigenous National Constitutional Convention at Uluru. Because during the dialogues, this, these are the ideas that they developed and they were refined at the Uluru Convention into the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So events like this are fabulous because we get to tell our side of the story and tell those pesky journalists off. It's interesting because this has been a very, very long journey and uh, for many quite exhausting and I know that you, like so many others, are just plum tuckered out from all of this. And some of the questions that we're getting from you on Slido, so please just keep popping them in, um, are, you know, basically asking what happens if it doesn't get up? What happens the next day? How do we involve the generations of people who are, at the moment, still considering their options? Um, you know, the demographic 50 to 65 are the ones that seem to be a little bit troublesome and without asking you to put your hands up, 
there might be one or two of us in that kit. What do we say to them? How do we get them engaged? How do we get them to understand that this has been so long coming that if we don't end up with a result that sees us recognised, the harm that that could do? For the last 10 years, conservative governments have had the opportunity to legislate a, uh, an advisory body could have even been representative um, in order to listen to what the authentic representatives of all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, want governments to talk to them about, sit down at the table and discuss with them in order to get policy setting rights. They didn't. In fact, uh, the Howard government abolished ATSIC. The Abbott government set up the Aboriginal advisory body or the Indigenous advisory body, of, I forget the exact name, chaired by Warren Mundine. Um, and uh, that didn't achieve anything. Uh, no transparency whatsoever, no policy announcements. And then by the end of Malcolm Turnbull's prime ministership, that had quietly disappeared and never mentioned again. Um, and of course, before ATSIC, there, there was the National Aboriginal uh, Conference. The government got rid of that. There was the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee. The government got rid of that. Uh, and if you go through our history, you find that every election or so, governments just think, okay, we have to come in with a new message. We're a new government. We're going to do something new. What will we do? Ah, we'll kill off the Aboriginal Consultative Committee. We'll change the Aboriginal policy. Guess what, voters? We're changing the Aboriginal policy. You'll feel so much better. You'll be richer. You'll be whiter. And year after year after year, all of our hard work goes down the drain. All of the advances we make under a policy go down the drain. I don't know how many times the CDP policy's been changed. That started back in the 70s as a simple work for the Dole scheme. And because the elders did not want everybody on sit-down money not working, right? And in fact, I gave a Charles Perkins oration here on exactly this, I think, way at the beginning of these orations. I think I was the second orator. It was years ago under, I think, the Abbott government. Um, and it has been changed over and over and over again. And now all of the people running the community development program, as it's now called, have, are pleading for stability and they want to go back to the old policy so that they can get people working and get, you know, enterprises operating in their communities. Meanwhile, on the no case, what, what's their big policy idea? What's their big solution for all of this? Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. They haven't been able to get the CDP policy right. They can't even do basic, a basic work for the Dole scheme, let alone jobs, jobs, jobs. And guess who is a major shareholder in a, an employment agency? Warren Mundine. So, you know, I mean, have a look at the policies that the no case are raising. Well, we'd have constitutional recognition if you get rid of the voice. They had years and years and years to give us constitutional recognition. They didn't. Um, well... We'd legislate the voice. Well, you know, we handed them two reports when we were doing the voice co-design project. We handed them the interim report and then the final report. And Dutton was in that cabinet. And they didn't legislate it. It was handed to them on a platter. Legislate this. No, they didn't do it. Uh, why aren't we closing the gap on all 19 targets? Why are we so far from doing it that I, my prediction is that over a third of our population will never 
close the gap? Well, it's because it's a policy-free zone. It's, you know, where the imaginary enemy of the state and every politician comes along and plays a political football with us because how do we frighten you into voting for them? Well, it's Aborigines, and if it's not Aborigines, it's asylum seekers. Oh, and then there's the LGBTIQ community. So, you know, it's, they play the old-fashioned fear tactics, but now they've got all the extra post-Trumpian tactics, the Steve Bannon tactics, the swamping the social media with bots and AI-generated Facebook lies, lies on Twitter. I've never been a member of the Communist Party. I did have a very cute Communist Party member boyfriend once here in Sydney. Um, <laughs> Uh, never been a member of the Communist Party, but, it, you know, if you only read the no-case bots about that evil Marcia Langton, you'd be horrified. You'd run out of the room. Anyway, so every Indigenous leader has been targeted. You've been targeted. Um, Megan Davis has been targeted by uh, these nefarious Trump-like... Uh, cult groups, you know, and, and if you read their garbage on Dark Emu Exposed, uh, on the Advance Australia and various other sites, you try to think about what kind of people write this garbage. Um, I, I think of them as, you know, sort of old stock traders that are losing money sitting around in their underpants in their mother's basements. <laughs> so, and they just, you know, I hate that person. I'm going to uh, They're just full of rage and spite. The things that they've said about all of us, I mean, they're so ridiculous and absurd, you know, it's gone past com comedy, it's gone past comedy, it's gone past tragedy. Oh, there's got to be a new label for the post-Trumpian world of hate. Um, so we face an uphill battle, a really tough uphill battle to convey our simple message and we need your help. We need everybody phoning friends handing out uh, Yes 23 materials at railway stations, bus stops, classrooms. So if I have persuaded you and you have time to make a phone call or have a uh, Yes Together lunch with your friends or join a local group and hand out material in your local neighbourhoods, please do so because I want everybody to wake up after the referendum and feel proud to be Australian and to know that we've taken that extra step to draw the line in the sand with our colonial past, embedded in our constitution, and empower Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first peoples to have a say in our own futures by making representations through the voice on laws and policies that affect us. We don't want to give you parking fines. We don't want to make you pay money to live here. We don't, we don't care about the submarines. We really don't care. You know, what we're really concerned about is health, housing, education, and lowering the incarceration rates for both adults and children. We could talk for such a long time, couldn't we? It's been an absolutely enthralling uh, short time. It's, it's gone so quickly and we are now on time. I'd like to invite our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mark Scott, to the stage to give a vote of thanks. Mark Scott.
Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, uh, Professor Masha Langton. Can I also begin by acknowledging traditional owners who are on the land of the Gadigal, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present. What does a university do? A university gathers people to explore important ideas and to learn, and I think we've all learned so much tonight from Professor Langdon, and I think this has been another of a series, I think, of memorable ev events that the university has hosted uh, in recent months. Uh, it was wonderful to host the winners of the Sydney Peace Prize, uh, Pat Anderson and Megan Davis at the end of last year, to have our graduate Noel Pierce come and speak with us some months ago and to have Professor Langdon here uh, with us tonight. And in a fortnight, Tom Karmer is coming to join us to again be a voice on the voice and to speak to us and to inform and engage our community on this vital national conversation that we're having. As was the case when we heard from Noel and from uh, Pat Anderson and Megan Davis, I was just struck again tonight by the patience and the graciousness of Professor Langdon as again she explained to us the history of the voice and the importance of the voice, where it came from, the memorable moments, the scholarly works of engagement that underpin it, but finally to explain to us that it's a generous act, it's a gracious act by our First Nations people to the rest of the nation. I was struck by her analysis that it is certainly symbolic, but it's very, very practical not to bring dignity to First Nations people, but to bring dignity to all Australians in a way that helps us put behind us that ugly colonial history that in many ways has been a stain on this nation now for more than 200 years. How do we move beyond all that as one nation coming together and putting behind us the divisive matters that keep us apart. It's the great unfinished business of the nation. And so it was wonderful to have one of the great thought leaders of the nation, one of the great public intellectuals of the nation, a truly historic figure in this nation, to come and patiently explain to us again what it's all about and what it's not all about and to urge us to respond to the gracious overture that's been made uh, to all of Australia through this opportunity of the voice. There are other words of encouragement too from Professor Langdon tonight. Read the Constitution. It's only 78 pages long. And if we're going to engage in debates around the Constitution, we should understand it. And also a reference to the report that she wrote with Tom Karma so that we can understand these issues that are so fundamental and are at stake. But in her own quiet and gracious way at the end, what was most important, and I think the call that the university wants to respond to, is the call to activation. This is going to be the most important issue we face as a nation in a generation. And it's looming. All We know what we're going to vote about. All that remains is the date. And once that date is set, all Australians will have the opportunity to respond to the invitation. And what we want to do here at the University of Sydney is to activate our campus and particularly to activate our students to assume their democratic right and responsibility in responding to this invitation and to actively engage in this vital democratic moment uh, that has been offered uh, to us. It's a once in a generation moment and we need to have that conversation with each other. As we do at a university, we need to welcome the debate, we need to welcome the divergent voices, we need to seek out the truth through all the rhetoric and all the noise and come to a place where we make an informed gracious response to the gracious overture that's been made to us. I was very interested uh, tonight to hear Professor Langdon concede that if you're a, an ordinary person, this can appear to be complex. This isn't the kind of stuff that you regularly think and engage about. 
But there's a lot of material out there if you seek to be engaged. And it's a great opportunity if you've done that study, if you do understand that, to patiently and graciously explain to others what it's all about. One of the things that we're doing here at the university, the National Centre for Cultural Competence, is to have online a suite of material that explains this, this, this important information to our students and our broader community. And I encourage you to look at that uh, at the university's website. It's a momentous time, important days ahead. We look forward to a vibrant, active engagement of our students and our community uh, in the weeks ahead. And I think a highlight for all of us will have been able to say that we were here when Professor Langton came and graciously once more made the offer to us and the rest of the nation in talking through the issues of The Voice. Will you join me in thanking Professor Langton for her time here again? And now to conclude the evening and to bring us together, I invite Professor Jackson Pulver. Twice in one night. Now, there's a couple of little things apart from just being so grateful for the generosity of your spirit this evening. There are some beautiful flowers here who come from a, a very wonderful Aboriginal florist down in Erskineville. Um, and we would like to, uh, if you want to take a memento home at this evening and possibly put it in a special book and dry it, uh, at the end of the evening, some of the team will come down with paper and you're more than welcome to take some of these beautiful flowers home with you. The second thing I'd like us to do, and this is the special thing I was hoping we might do together this evening, is behind me in a moment on the screen, uh, there will be the statement from the heart. And I know that this is something that was created by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's not something that came out of the clear blue sky. It's been something that's been in so many hearts for so many decades, centuries, some would say. And I was wondering if you would feel OK about reading it out aloud with me. How do you feel about that? Should we do that? Okay. So as soon as it comes up, here it is. The Uluru Statement from the Heart. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the South Australia, made this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes. <laughs> There's always got to be a technical hiccup. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to common law from time in the world, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty, and has never been ceded or extinguished and now exists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possess the land for 60 millennia and this sacred thing disappears from a world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, 
We believe this ancient sovereignty in its shining crew as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aligned from their families and unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And they are youth languishing detention and obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis are the the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powers. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take the rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk into the worlds and their culture will be a gift to our country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after the struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek the Makarata Commission to supervise our process of agreement making between governments and the First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We need base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Certainly a most memorable night and one that uh, I hope you'll go home and uh, talk about people with, get uh, more information, share the love, and know that we have a long way to go, that uh, even though the referendum will be announced soon, there's a lot of work to do in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years to make Australia a place where we all belong. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Good night.